Yeah. 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 Yeah.
judges change transcripts, everything under the sun. And our legal system is pretty bad. And the reason is the Supreme Court has decided on its own accord that it doesn't have the time to listen to everybody. They get about 8,000 applications and they take 80 a year. That's it. So, honestly, the only way you get into the Supreme Court is basically by having some sort of a case which is gathering international notoriety. Otherwise, forget it. You will die there. And I was fortunate enough to get into the Supreme Court. Once I did, they got three postponements. And then that's the only reason they had to release me. And one of the tapes I wanted to show you was that Lindsey Graham, after I'm released, and you can find it on the internet, him in there basically introduced the law, of course they say it's for terrorism, but they can now do what they did to me to anybody. They can throw you in prison indefinitely without a trial and take your orders away. Canada has also now adopted the same policy. All they have to do is say that, oh, you're somehow, we think that you're aiding the terrorists. They don't have to present any proof, nothing, we think. And it's a very dangerous precedent. And Lindsey Graham introduced this after they released me. And I was told directly from people on Capitol Hill and elsewhere that that bill was because of me. They had to release them because if I got to the Supreme Court and won, then they could never do this to anybody. So what they do is they release me, they then go back to the Supreme Court. Oh, he's no longer there. The case is moot. So then they don't decide. So this is basically how the law really works. And as long as nobody rules, they can keep doing whatever they want to anybody at any time. So unfortunately, when we're talking about NSA and all this other kind of stuff, you have absolutely zero rights. None whatsoever. All right? And the way the legal system is, all right, we're supposed to have the Fifth Amendment. You're supposed to have the right to remain silent. Good luck. Technically, I was actually never in prison. It was the corporate officer who was in. See, I have my personal rights, but I'm not put in as an individual, as a corporate officer, because the corporation has no rights. So they play with the words back and forth, every which way that they want to play with it, to justify what they're doing. And this is why um, the concern really is, honestly, when we're talking about security and what they're trying to do with the internet and, and all these things going after Apple's phone, this is very serious stuff. Because there's not going to be anything left. And the way they do things with elections, I can tell you the Scottish wanted to leave the UK. Who did they come in to count the votes? People from Europe. All right? And there's film on it that they were taking bags of votes and throwing them in the rivers. Uh, it was rigged to make sure the Scottish could not leave. Now we're going to have the Brit exit, and you can bet they're going to be over there in full force trying to prevent that from happening. Why? Because if Britain leaves, everybody else is going to start doing the same thing, and Europe will then cave in. So if this is all about power and government. It has nothing really to do with anything of rights or whatever. In presidential elections, honestly, most of the time it's a joke. Uh, if we look honestly at <clears throat> Obama, did he do anything different than, uh, than Bush? Nope. He did the same thing with Ukraine. I mean, he already, he, uh, Bush went into <clears throat> Iraq. He wanted to go into Syria. All right. And I say, all this stuff, why? Because honestly, they're just the bobblehead on the thing on the back of the windshield. That's it. All right? You have an unelected belly in there, which are there all the time. They do not change because of the, the figurehead at the top. 
uh, changes. And Alexander, all the people who were ahead of the NSA under Bush were still there under Obama. So, you know, we are living in a fantasy world to think that you actually have a right to change the president and things will actually change every election. What do they say? Vote for me for change. All right, it's, it, I don't care who it is, every one of them, every election you go back, they all say the same thing. All right, um, change you can believe in, change for the, I mean, it's nothing ever changes, except for the worst. Because the bureaucracy is always there and they want more and more power. Now they're losing that power. Um, the code that they had me in for, I can tell you, um, which is basically why they want to make this Hollywood movie out of it, and why I agreed to come down here for, for half. But um, <clears throat> effectively, uh, I, I can tell a, a, a quick story when I was a kid. My father was a lawyer, grew up with law, etc. So I always heard constitutional arguments discussed between his partners at dinner tables and stuff like that. And so I was, he had and son on the door when I was born. I used my father's law books. It's the local, you know, uh, there was a store next to where all the kids used to hang out from after school. And he didn't like the kids. So he ran for mayor. And then he puts a cop at the corner to give us all tickets to try and chase us away from the corner all the time. So I looked at the books and I said, hey guys, all these signs are illegal. Don't worry about it. I got it. Do they believe me? Mm -hmm. I said, everybody sit on their, on their cars, we'll get the tickets. Because when parking signs have to be so much from the crown from the road, every so often, they just do whatever they want to do. They're all over the place. I said, this is all illegal. They had to have permits to even put them up. So I went to court. <clears throat> we all got tickets. Went up and I said, Your Honor, I said, Can I speak for everybody since we have all the same tickets? He said, Yeah, okay, fine. I brought out that law. He had to rule in my favor. Case dismissed. So then the guy gets mad, he does it again with stop signs. The same thing. I go back to court, we all went in, I said, These signs are all illegal. He then gets pissed off. He has to dismiss the case. And then he says to me, he says, I think you're practicing law without a license. I'm going to call your father. So then I go home. My father goes, oh, you're using my law books to, to you know, defend your, your friends. I said, hey, I won every case so far. <laughs> <laughs> so it just kind of soured me on law. I said, wait, where does this judge have the right to call my father because I won in court? You know, I mean, this is crazy. So I started saying, now, forget this. I don't want to go down that path. And so he pushed me off into, well, you got to do something. Pushed me off into computers. I wasn't really sure. I got into working in the mainframes back then. We were doing assemblers and things of that nature. So um, I then, back then, uh, RCA was actually one of the biggest. They sold their computer division to IBM Univac. But they kept um, servicing, in which they, <clears throat> at the time, it was NORAD up at the top of the globe in Greenland, and they would just drop you off up there. And you had to just be there in case something happened. Um, so it was a very, very boring job. And I decided, no, I don't, didn't want to do that. And the married guys were getting, you know, Hawaii, London, stuff like that. I was offered Thule, Greenland, Guam, and Vietnam. Um, so I quit. I said, no, forget it. And I went back to, to basically what trading and things of that nature. And, but those computer skills I had learned, I said, gee, I can create a computer to do all this stuff. And that's what I did. So... Those of you that might have heard from, you know, all the banks were hiring quants and stuff like that, that's because of me. And in 85, I was called in uh, for the, uh, uh, the birth of the G5, which taught me 
to be very careful with government. They invited a bunch of people in, and effectively what they do is they want to pretend that they have consulted all these analysts. Then they stand up and they give whatever it is that they want to do. It has nothing to do with anybody testified about. So you realize you're just being used. That's it. And so they can pretend that they've consulted experts and all the rest of the stuff. Total nonsense. So I kind of felt it was just a real waste of time. And I wrote a letter to Ronald Reagan at the time. He had to answer me because I was one of the guys called in. So I get this nice two-page letter back. says, thank you very much. But we disagree with you. Um, you're the only one really with a computer model. Uh, until somebody else can do this and say volatility is going to increase, uh, you know, we can't listen to just one. So, okay, fine. Then the 87 crash comes. Everybody knew I was the guy that went to the White House because they even told me, oh, you'll never be called again. I said, I really don't care. You know, you guys aren't really paying me. And it's all, you know. What goes on is over millions of dollars a year, you put out studies and they tell you what the conclusion of the study should be. Because every bill in Congress that passes has to have an economic study. They don't care if it's real or not. They say, look, this is what we're going to do. This is what it's got to say. Put it in there so we can say that we listen to some expert. This is really the way government operates. Total, absolute nonsense. So <clears throat> I was not interested in that. And they said, oh, you'll never be called. I said, thanks. Thank you very much. Not, you know, let me go do my own thing. So that's where my confrontation, to, so, to some degree, begins. When 87 comes, <clears throat> that stock market crash happens because I went out of this committee. I get called and I said, thank you very much, not interested, goodbye. So they start calling my friends. And it was actually Jack Schwager called me and he said, Marty, if you don't do this, they're going to come take our computers. Now he's pulling to my heart stretch. Because they were blaming computer trading for the first time with the 87 crash. So I said, oh, come on. Well, you can call up the Brady Commission report. At the very end, I think it's the last paragraph, you'll find something I had to fight for. At the end, the Brady Commission didn't really do anything to the market, put in some circuit breakers, that was it. They left pretty much everything intact. Why? Because I see you people are, are, you're the ones that caused this. Because they started G5 in 1985, so oh, we're going to move the dollar 40%. I said, you created all this volatility because you're trying to manipulate the market. I said, you're the ones that, re that were responsible. So at the very bottom of that commission report, it says, we think something uh, with foreign exchange had to do with this, but, you know, we're not sure. Fine, you know, um, we think foreign exchange had something to do with it. And just left it at that. That's the best you're ever going to get from the government admitting that they ever make a mistake. All right, so <clears throat> uh, after that, when all these banks start hiring bots and trying to create models and stuff, they're all trying to mimic me. Why? Because they knew I had a, a physics background. I went through engineering school, all right, and I had computer programming and a trade. So they thought, well, let's get people in here from physics, and then we can start creating some models, and then you start with, uh, <clears throat> that didn't really work out too well, because encoding, as most of you will know, uh, a lot of us can write a program, very nice. But if you do not understand the subject matter of what you're trying to actually do, you end up with something completely different. So they brought in two guys, which you can search on the internet, won the Nobel Prize, Black and Schultz. They create this little model, and that created <clears throat> basically the whole long-term capital management collapse. And we're given Nobel Prizes for this wonderful theory that they did, which completely blew up. All right, that was 1998. So what we have is government is really going crazy. And they're trying to control something they know is out of control. 
And that's really what's going on here. Um, when with me, they basically said, <clears throat> we want the code. I said, forget it. I'm not, I'm not going to give it to you. I had a lawyer who they basically chased out, who was a good a personal friend of mine. And he warned me when the case began. He says, they're going to ask you to be a snitch. They'll put you on a leash. You'll never be able to do anything. They'll drop all the charges, make it look very nice. And <clears throat> then you become a snitch in the industry and you have to tell them everything that everybody's doing all the time. You then also have to have permission if you want to go on a vacation outside the country. So my friend, who was a former prosecutor, warned me of this. He says, I strongly advise you not to do it. You will be a dog on your leash for the rest of your life. I said, thanks for that information. And sure enough, nice little walk around the park. Oh, you, you know, you know so much, so many people. You could be such valuable information to us. I said, thanks a lot, goodbye. Not interested. So this is the way they do things. And uh, what they're interested in, they have no idea. All right. For example, now there's guys are uh, developing models for intraday trading, and the CFTC says, "Oh, well, maybe they could be manipulating markets, and everybody's source code has to be given to us." They wouldn't even know what what it says. All right, these people are in government. They're really brain dead. They really are. And their theories of everything is, comes from what they do. All right, so I was there in court, and they actually um, said that I manipulated the world economy. <laughs> <laughs> now, <clears throat> I'm just like looking at them like, what? And my lawyer was very smart. And he stood up. And he says, all right, fine, Your Honor. Yes, he does. Where's the law that says he can't? <laughs> and, he said, and he says, in fact, he controls your salary even. And the judge is looking and laughing at him. But their view is this. <clears throat> I stand up, I give a lecture around the world, whatever. And if I say gold's going to go up, whatever, and it does, all right, see? All those people that he spoke to, they all stand up and do it instantaneously. So that's their vision of controlling, all right? Because that's exactly what they do. They come out, they make press statements, they're bullshit, whatever, they try to move the people this way. So when it goes against them, what happens? Oh, well, somebody's got to be to blame. So they just basically said, oh, I have more minions than they have. And you're just looking at them like, you know, what planet are you people from? But you honestly have to, to listen to some of this stuff that they, and they will just say whatever it takes at that moment. Um, <clears throat> initially, you know, I had a, a bail hearing. They actually, they stood up and it showed me how deceitful these people really are. They said, oh, your honor, he's gonna flee to London where he has a mansion full of antique cars and art and all kinds of stuff. And first of all, if such a place existed and I went to London, London would immediately actually me back anyhow. But, you know, I'm, I'm not the timid type. So I will stand up for what I think is right. And all I did was I raised my hand. I said, Your Honor, can I please have the address? And immediately they said, oh, but we had no good information. What information? You're not even saying who they are. All I gotta do is raise my hand. They will say whatever it takes to win that day. It doesn't have to be true. They just make it up. And you listen to this stuff and then the, the newspapers print whatever they say as if it's absolute gospel. It, it's amazing. It's really is amazing. But our press, we don't have free press at all. And I knew a couple of uh, journalists uh, before, and they were not even allowed to, to write about it. One of them was Mark Pittman, who was at Bloomberg News, who had just done an article on us and what we were doing, etc. And when his 
when my case began, he says, Marty, don't worry about it. We're not going to let them do this to you. He was taken off, gone. And today, what's amazing, we put my name into the Bloomberg terminal where we used to actually publish. Nothing comes up. Everything's been erased, as if nothing ever happened. So um, it's quite interesting how they sanitize things. Um, and <clears throat> really, it was, I would say, this movie illustrated even more. I mean, perhaps remember where they said, uh, oh, North Korea was trying to block a film. This film has appeared around the world. Um, the guy just, uh, there was a film festival, I think in June. And they can select two films from every country. And Mark is better, actually. The forecast was selected, and his other film, which is now just coming out, The Promise, also about the US legal system. And so he's quite well known, and he got both slots for Germany. So, which is, I think, the first time in history, actually. Um, but the two countries that this film did not appear in, Switzerland and the United States. Why? That's where the bankers are. It appeared in London, there was a big <clears throat> debut, and it was very interesting. I was getting emails, I didn't go over for it, and I was getting emails from friends saying, oh, you should see what they're doing to you in the newspapers. There was an article, Martin Armstrong says bankers are worth every penny. And I go, what? And I went online, it's some other guy's picture. It was the night of the debut. Big spread, <clears throat> London Evening Times. So major newspaper. So I went back to my friends. I said, no, it's a different guy, just the same name. They said, no, no, it's you. They took a picture of the print edition. The print edition has my photograph. The online edition has somebody else. And it was the night of the debut. So who does this? I mean, this is the London Evening Standard. I mean, this is, you know, you talk about major you know, newspapers. Somebody's picking up these phones and saying, do this, do that, whatever. The distributors for the US and for Switzerland, they, they buy the distribution rights. They paid them, no problem. They just didn't refuse to show it. So somebody's eating that money. You're just paying the money and not basically putting it into the marketplace to make it back. So you're willing to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to prevent something from being seen. And this is very, very curious. So, um, and like I said, the only two countries were basically US and Switzerland. It's now being revu reviewed by Putin and to be put on in, German, in, uh, in Russia. And I think it appears in Japan starting in June. So it's making its way around the world. But, uh, it just shows you how much political nonsense is really going on out here. And it, it just, it's really quite amazing. It doesn't take conspiracy theories or, or anything else. So uh, my concern is definitely security. And um, so we've been, you know, desperately trying to take the code which they wanted. And <clears throat> Why? Uh, I can tell you briefly that uh, what moves markets or, or the rise and fall of countries is really capital flows. And in the 1980s, early mid 1980s, we had a client who was the Universal Bank of Lebanon. And they found somebody with a, a ledger that had written the Lebanese pound down every day back in the 1850s. And they asked me, gee, could you create a model on it? I said, sure. You know, they actually sent somebody over with the suitcase and the chain with the whole nine yards. We put in the information, and out comes, and it says their country's going to fall apart in eight days. Now, I'm thinking, oh, what's going on here? You know, um, so I called them on the phone, and I said, look, I think there's some sort of a glitch or something. I said, it says your country's going to fall apart in, like, in eight days. I mean, the response was very telling. He says, well, what currency do you think would be best? <laughs> 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 I 
I just told you your country's going to fall apart in eight days. You don't think that's nuts? I said, Swiss Frank. Okay, thank you very much. In eight days, the Lebanese war began. Then I saw it again. We had a client, uh, a Saudi client. He calls me on the phone. And he says, gee, what's gold going to do tomorrow? He says, uh, <clears throat> Iran's going to start bombing shipping in the Gulf. I said, what? He said, yeah, yeah, they're going to start bombing all the shipping in the Gulf. What do you think gold's going to do tomorrow? I said, well, it looks like it's going to go up at 15, 20 bucks. Okay, fine, thanks. That was the Iran-Iraq war starts. And I'm like, how is, what, what is going on here? I began to realize that if you were going to invade a country, or you're going to start a war, or you're going to do something, what do you do? You move your assets. So the computer was picking up the capital flows. You can't say it's you versus somebody else. It just says, hey, something's happening here, and they're moving out. So in 1998, now I have you know, about uh, more than 10 years' experience with this phenomenon. I stood up at our London conference and I said, look, Russia's going to collapse and I give it 30 to 60 days. I didn't realize at the time someone from the London Financial Times happened to sneak in and sitting in the back. Next thing I know, our forecast is on the front page of the London Financial Times. Uh, and says, oh, Armstrong says the rush is going to collapse in 30 to 60 days. And gee, if everybody listens to him, I guess it will. Well, it collapsed. That's the long-term capital management debacle, etc. And that's when the CIA calls me and says, all right, look, we've been following you guys for some time. <coughs> we want the money. So I said, look, we'll run any study you want here, no problem. They want me to go to Washington and build this thing for them. I said, look, it took me like 17 years to build this thing. I'm not going to go down there and build it from scratch. We'll run whatever you want here. He says, no, we have to own it. That starts it. All right. About six months later, the case pretty much begins. I don't know who starts what and how. All right. But all I can tell you is that they are very, very paranoid. And um, I think, and I've been told by others who I know in the computer field have been called by them asking them, trying to build, mimic what we do. Um, good luck. But uh, <clears throat> they think that largely any information out there, any system, any computer type thing, um, they have to know what it is, how it's happening, because maybe they can use it. And this effectively, <clears throat> I was told, it's national security. Forget it. When they use those words, you have zero threats. Zero. Okay? And um, <clears throat> effectively, they can do whatever they want to you at any time. And they'll call it something else. Um, there was a famous uh, <clears throat> march on Washington during the panic of 1893. It was called Coxley's Army. And he marched all the way down. And actually FCR's theories of, of uh, work camps and things of this nature all came from this guy. And he led his army all the way down there. Thousands of people joined. It was basically for unemployment, things of this nature. <clears throat> How did they stop it? They arrested him for what? Walking on the grass. Mm -hmm. So just like the Occupy Wall Street for New York. Oh, they're occupying, uh, you know, something they're dirty, whatever. Oh, we're not doing it because of what they're saying. There are thousands of laws. There's a book that you can find. It's called Everybody Bio, you know, commits three felonies every day. Because there's so many laws. And they can find whatever they need to put you away. You did this, you did that, whatever. Structuring, they call Pay one, I've met people that they paid off one credit card with another. Oh, that's structuring. Yeah. Uh, if you <coughs> go to a bank and you take out cash, uh, it used to be $10,000. You took out $9,900 three times, 18 months in jail. Uh, so now it's down to uh, actually 
three thousand dollars. Most people don't realize that because it's stuffed in the in the uh, uh, in the Patriot Act. And some banks now, if you go in and you ask for twenty five hundred dollars mm -hmm. in cash, they have to do a form. All right. So, and if they don't ask you, they're still doing it. All right. I was going over. See, we did a conference in Berlin. <laughs> And they're all hunting money for everything. Um, I first encountered it in, I took the, the train, I was in a meeting room in Brussels, and I, I took a, the train over to uh, London. And what happened, I was in a meeting with the people in government that I know there, so I was dressed, so I had a tie, etc. And so what happens is, usually if you were in business, they didn't bother you. And look for people buying souvenirs and trinkets and things of that nature. They all go by, you come in. I said, me. I pull out my passport, so I'm American, I'm just here for meetings. That was, still wasn't good enough. They wanted to see my ticket. Where did I buy it? Did I buy it in London or did I buy it in Brussels? I said, I bought it in Brussels, I'm here for a meeting, I'm going back, and I'm returning to the States from Frankfurt, not even from London. All right, go ahead. So we had a conference in Berlin. So when I decided to come back, I said, well, okay, fine. I put on jeans, sneaks, took everything off. Come back, I figured out, I'll try and dress casual. Traveling by yourself, not a good idea. You, come in. I said, me, how much money do you have on you? First question, not that I buy any trinkets, how much cash do you have on you? I said, hey, about $5,000 or whatever. Okay. I said, I'm under the 10000 I had a show. I, had take, I took $3,000 out in cash with the slip from the bank. I didn't use it just in case you're overseas, your credit card gets stolen or something like that. You got to have something as a backup, right? I had a show on the slip. Look, I bought I withdrew it in the United States. I didn't spend it. It's... I use my credit cards, just, all right, fine, go. They're hunting money everywhere. As of January 1st, 2017, all the countries are gonna be sharing information on everybody globally. All right, so this is them losing power. They need money desperately to cover their ass, really. And they're losing power because they can't control everything. Um, this is why they put in kill switches that the president can kill the internet, stuff like this. This is what they're afraid of. Because they know they're losing power. We are moving towards the end of that bubble where government is going to collapse. And I, I think over the next four years you're going to see a lot of interesting stuff. But um, <clears throat> this is the security because they're going after everybody and computer fields, etc. It's why we're trying to get our stuff up on the web and we'll probably go public, but in Hong Kong, not the United States. Um, so, <clears throat> yes, we've been looking to hire as many people in machine learning areas as possible. Um, so we'll take all the resumes, that's fine. <laughs> um, but uh, I think the only possible way uh, out of this is, is is you have to crash and burn first. But we, before we get to that point, these people are going to be grabbing everything they possibly can trying to prevent it. But the budgets are, are, are in deficit all the way around, and nobody ever asked a single thing. Of, why do we borrow every year? They have no intention of paying anything. 70% of the national debt is a cumulative interest. Not even, it didn't even go to build roads and schools for, for kids or anything. It's the interest. It's why the bankers are there. All right, this is why the bankers basically are the ones that, that generate all the money, give them to, to everybody. Um, and the, the two candidates that uh, Goldman Sachs came out and said that they were dangerous for who? Bernie and Trump. Why is it the two that they're not contributing money to? Anybody else, it doesn't matter if it's Hillary or Cruz or whatever, they have both sides. They own both sides all the time. 
all the way down the line into Congress, presidential elections, it doesn't matter. Uh, so this is really what we're kind of fighting, and eventually it just goes pop. And that's unfortunately how history goes, but this is largely what our model has been showing. And then we're just at one, we're approaching one of those focal points, and this is um, this is what it's all about. This is you know why you know Thomas Jefferson said that uh, a little revolution every now and then is is necessary. And because they just we are complacent, we allow them to do whatever the heck they want. They steal whatever they want, and they steal five dollars. They said, well, okay, fine. I got away with that. Only steal ten. Oh, hundred. They get up to 100,000. Well, you didn't say anything before. You know, why are you suddenly mad? They just keep up the same thing. Um, so this is really, unfortunately, what we're looking at. And um, so with the code and everything else, they just want everything they can possibly get their hands on. So I would really be uh, concerned, but we're trying to take our systems and open it up to everybody on uh, on the planet, I think, is the only way to kind of defeat them. We do have an awful lot of governments. Everybody watches us now. That's fine. You know, I don't really care so much about that. Um, but uh, as long as everybody's sharing the same information, it's okay. As far as turning over any kind of a code just to them, no thank you. Um, not interested. And people have asked, well, gee, well, why didn't you just turn it over us? Do you really think that they would release you after such a thing? No way. You know, forget it. You can't trust these people for anything. Anything. My, as I said, my lawyer was a friend of mine, and he said, you will be a dog on a leash for the rest of your life. And he was very, very true. When they took all the money away from him, and he said, they strip me of lawyers. He said, I'll represent them for free. What did they do? The judge turns to the government and says, oh, maybe he's, he's his consulary. Yes, Your Honor, we're investigating for that. He can no longer represent him. Never used them for anything before. We were just friends. All right, all they have to say is, we're investigating him. Now he, can, but he cannot represent him. So they have tricks to get rid of everybody for everything at any time. So unfortunately, that's what we're facing um, with the security. I think that going after cell phones and things, this is all part and parcel of the game. And I can, <clears throat> I'll end with, with this. Um, when in 1997, there was the Asian currency crisis and I was invited to China. So I said, yeah, okay, fine. You know, I went over there, um, and I had a tour back then. They, you know, went to the central bank, and they took me off into this facility with a whole, you know, black car line and everything, and I thought I was going down really the rabbit hole. We went to this facility. It was surrounded by tanks. There was three huge satellites on the top. I go, I'm going into a military installation. What the hell is going on here? The room was filled with hundreds of people surfing the internet and downloading everything. This was back in 1997. All right, so I, I was there and I experienced Russia. Fine, both were communist, but substantially different. And this is the point. In China, why is it rebounded so quickly? Because they didn't care about what you thought. It was called the tall poppy syndrome. If you stuck your head up, it got cut. As long as you kept your mouth shut and you were with everybody else, we don't care. Russia, what was the difference? Stalin was paranoid. He cared what you thought. This is the line we're going down. By going after all your cell phones, recording everything, they're paranoid. They are scared to death exactly like Stalin. All right? And <clears throat> what did they tell their kids? Your parents aren't your real parents, the state is. So if your parents ever say anything against the state, turn them in. They turn the whole country into snitches. So um, that, unfortunately, is the directive that they're moving now. 
They're not moving down the Chinese path of the tall poppy. They're moving down the Stalin path of paranoia. There's no other reason to record everybody's cell phones and keep them in that big facility that they've created perpetually. If they're listening for terrorists, great example. You had the bombers in Boston. Two kids using cell phones. Could they pick them up in advance? No. If you're recording every phone call in the country, if not the world, and you're and you're you have a computer going through listening for keywords or whatever, by the time you get to it, if you're on the phone and saying, "Listen, I'm going to bomb this tomorrow," good luck. They'll never find it. So all this nonsense about terrorism, whatever, it is nonsense. It's basically to co create dossiers on everybody exactly as Stalin did. And <clears throat> you can go online and find out how paranoid they really were. When the Berlin Wall came down, there was a collection of jars. What was in it? Used underwear. Go, used underwear? They went into people's houses and stole their underwear and put them in jars with their name on. Why? Because if you went missing, they brought out the dogs. Here, there's his scent. Go get them. Wow. You can Google it. You'll see jars of everybody's used underwear. Quite amazing. I hope we don't go back. <laughs> but this is what, unfortunately, what we have to look for. Okay. So, thank you. That was amazing. Uh, what's next is the Dimonso workshop. And then remember, nine, between 9 and 10, we're going to start a party at the Jazz Club. So, uh, see you soon.